Well, welcome. It's great to have you here at the Mary Baker Eddy Library. I'm Jonathan Eder, Programs Manager at the library. And um, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to have the uh, pre-talk with our guest speakers, Dr. Sarah Giorgini, that took place in the Mapparium, but it's, uh, it's given me this, um, this energy and this global feel, but I'm gonna resist the, uh, the temptation to go traveling, which she has left me with, um, from that presentation and enjoy with you uh, her talk on her book, uh, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family. So just so you know in advance, there will be an opportunity to engage with you with questions and answers um, near the end of the program. So we're looking forward to having that dialogue with you. Uh, we're recording tonight's event. So uh, a, a reminder to turn off your electronic devices um, so that they don't make sounds during the presentations. But that doesn't mean that you cannot make sounds. Um, <laughs> We look forward to your sounds. Um, and I suppose if you have a very, very, very smart phone, perhaps it would make the appropriate sound. But just to be, uh, just to be careful, I guess we should turn them all off at this point. But we're heading to that moment when the phones will be as involved as we are, I imagine, with these kinds of events. Um, if for any reason none of you wants the back of your head included in the film, uh, of this event, during the last, in the last two rows, your, your, the back of your head is free um, from being captured by the camera's eye. But um, we're, we're, the front of your heads are, are wonderful, so I, um, I'm disappointed that we don't actually have a, a camera capturing that. But um, it, you're lovely to look at, so we're going to enjoy being with you tonight. Um, just to explain, you know, why we are hosting Dr. Giorgini here at the Mary Baker Eddy Library. A lot of the basis for the connection is that our guest speaker is the series editor for the uh, John Adams Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And the Massachusetts Historical Society, I would say more than any other institution, has been a guide and an inspiration for us at the library in terms of our own work with our collections in digitizing them, in analyzing them, in annotating them, in organizing them so that they are as useful for people who want to use our collections as possible. So we're always very grateful to you at, at Mass Historical for kind of shining the light and showing us the, the way. Um, so we, we have a number of papers projects going on, including about the Mary Baker Eddy papers, which is, of course, central for us. Um, just uh, last, uh, recently we did a presentation about the papers of Erwin D. Canham, uh, who is a long-serving uh, editor of the Christian Science Monitor, so that's another ambitious project for us as we're going through 200 to 300 boxes of, of his papers. Um, so it's, it's just great for us to, to be doing that work and to have our, uh, our, our good friends up the street help us, give us an example of how to go about it. Also, the perspective of her book, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family, is very thought-provoking for us and, and for me in terms of how to think about history, how to think about Mary Baker Eddy, how to think about how we engage around the history of the Christian science movement because of great importance to Dr. Giorgini in her book is to bring the lens of family history to her understanding of the Adamses. Um, she writes in her introduction, quote, as for their religious affiliations, many Americans now begin their reply well with, well, I was raised in whatever, but individual family stories of religious history are curiously rare. End of quote. She then goes on to state, quote, family history is a vital primary source for intellectual and cultural historians, since the home is where religious ideas are inherited, debated, discarded, reinvented, or renewed. And I think I go to, through that process quite a bit just myself, <laughs> um, but I'm um, happy to say it always comes out on the side of renewal. 
But I know that, um, that, that that theme is so important for the Adamses in, uh, in the story we're about to hear about today. So um, that focus on family history and how we understand what was important to Mary Baker Eddy, what was in, has been important over the generations for Christian scientists, um, is an interesting and I think very profound lens for us to understand what we have here in the histories that are represented in our collection. So thank you for providing that kind of model for us. Um, so I'll just finish by saying, in Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy writes, home is the dearest spot on earth, and it should be the center, though not the boundary, of the affections. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sarah Giordini to speak about the many boundaries geographical, spiritual, and cultural that the Adamses traversed in their celebrated family history. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Russell. Thank you to all of you and the incredible team here for welcoming me and all these Adamses into your community tonight. I'm really delighted to talk about the Adamses' religious journeys in light of the connections between this faith and the ones that they explored, between spirituality, innovation, and exploration. So first off, I'd just like to tell you why I got started on a 300-year family history of religion, because I certainly didn't plan on it to be a full three centuries worth of work in a decade of my life when I started, a decade well spent walking alongside them, trying to meet the gods and ideas that they sampled and tried so hard to understand. So let me take you back to exactly the document where it began. When I started work, at the Adams Papers Editorial Project at the Massachusetts Historical Society, I began where most researchers do, transcription. So my job was to sit with the original manuscript, in this case, John Adams' letter book, and my computer, and to transcribe exactly with every bit of non-standard spelling and quirky 18th century punctu punctuation, the words that he rendered on the page. And that means we kind of get those 18th century voices in our head, right? We know that someone like Abigail Adams said Benjamin Frank Ling. She wrote about Canada instead of Canada. And she grew cowcumbers and sparrygrass, cucumbers and asparagus on the farm in Quincy. So it's super important that we create an authoritative transcription that scholars and Everyone in a K through 12 National History Day project can also use in our free digital edition. So that was me, sitting there and working my way through John Adams' letter book. And I often think that I came in on a particularly good time for a historian of religion, because my job was to transcribe the summer of 1812. So a momentous year in American history and for the Adamses as well. John Adams, formerly president, now retired, um, had a lot of thoughts and feelings about what was going on in the world. He'd recently renewed his correspondence and his bromance on the page with Thomas Jefferson and with their joint friend, Benjamin Rush. And John Adams' letters, despite what was going on in the world, and it was a lot, right? The War of 1812 looming, British troops landing in Michigan, Napoleon sweeping toward Russia, John Adams thought back on his ancestry and his own family history. And looking back on the Adams family settlement, which was about the 1630s on here in Massachusetts, he reflected to his old friend Benjamin Rush, what has preserved this race of Adamses in all their ramifications in such numbers, health, peace, comfort, and mediocrity, I believe it is religion without which they would have been rakes, fops, sops, gandlers, starved with hunger, frozen with cold, been melted away, 
scalped by Indians and disappeared. So I knew one thing for sure about the Adamses, even after working there for one month. They most certainly did not disappear from American history. In fact, they were at the heart of political power for more than a century, right? They became incredible cultural critics and political agents, the Adams men and women alike. So when I read this, as I transcribed it, I thought, aha, John Adams is throwing me a lead from 1812. He's telling me that religion is the root cause of all of their success and problems in America. And I want to see if that's true. So fortunately for me, I had a lot of Adamses to investigate. So you can see clearly here the family line from the Puritan Adamses of Henry and Edith, um, who we just saw in the Maparium originated near Somerset, England all the way down to the 20th century Adamses. And when I began this project, I thought, okay, I'll do John and Abigail, but I'll stop at John Quincy. Then I got to John Quincy and I thought, okay, but I'll stop at the Civil War. And then I just kept going. Because at every turn, the Adamses surprised me. And fortunately, I had some thinking to do about why we needed to study this family again, right? Why do we need another book on the Adamses? Well, for a couple of reasons, right? We want to think about the greater structural changes in American society and how faith changes over time, both in thought and in practice. I wanted to amplify the voices of the laity. So often, the American religious history books that I'd read, kind of the standing historiography, revolves around charismatic leaders or philanthropic associations or pamphlet wars. And I thought, no, no, I'd like to see what it's like to hear the history of religion in America from the pews. I want the audience, I want the people who participate to tell me what they see and do. Because in American religion, people vote with their feet. They travel, they sample new denominations, and they often encounter new religious ideas by talking to other people. Most people in America, then and now, learn about new religions from each other. And I was really interested to think about that idea of encounter. Now, fortunately for me, the Adamses traveled a lot, right? So we have three diplomats in a row, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams, that very much end cap the traditional American historical narrative of revolution to republic. So that brings me from the revolution through the Civil War. And because they traveled a lot, they also wrote a lot down. We have diaries, we have letter books, we have poetry, we have photographs, we have lots of evidence of the different cultures that they tried to interpret. Now, I was interested in what kind of faith they developed from all of this exploration. And what I came to see is that over the generations, the Adamses were Christian, they were cosmopolitan, they were curious, and they were famous for it. People welcomed them into new religions wherever they went, which I thought was a really interesting thing to explore. In turn, the Adamses developed what I call, and I'm not the first person to use this phrase, a sense of cosmopolitan Christianity. Cosmopolitan in two ways. One, they're really well-read and well-traveled, right? They're really highly attuned to worship aesthetics as they go from place to place. And two, cosmopolitan in the sense that they are critics. They really hone their critical edge, listening to sermons, thinking about new religious ideas, and they take that sense of criticism and they bring it on home to New England religion. And they see how American religion stacks up next to the rest of the world. And the last thing that I wanted to do in thinking about why study this family again is to use a 10-generation archive. I was just marveling, thinking of those great boxes you have to go through. Anytime you know a historian hears there's boxes to go through, I think, wow. Um, and fortunately for us, we also have boxes to go through with the Adams papers. Um, the Adams family papers stretch across 10 generations from the Puritan era 
Actually, till now, we're still collecting Adam's papers, I'm proud to say. Um, just about a quarter of a million manuscript pages, 600 reels of microfilm. They're all open for research and just a few blocks away here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, and the Adams, as I mentioned, they were great cultural interpreters. They had this great ability to be in the room where history happened. Often they were a huge part of making that history happen. So we see a couple of major moments in American history that they were here for. I want to start our little high-speed tour, and it will be a high-speed tour, through the Adamses, from the Puritans to the Progressives, with this monument to Henry Adams. And this is found in the Hancock Cemetery in Quincy. So if you've had a chance to visit the beautiful Adams National Historical Park, um, which I highly encourage. This was John and Abigail's beloved retirement home, often known as Peacefield. Um, just a little ways from the home and opposite the United First Parish Church, where they made their home as a family for about three centuries, John Adams drafted the text for this monument. This is what, in his mind, his Puritan ancestor was like. So this is where I started. I started with a monument. And like many monuments, not every line held up to historical research that was carved into the marble. And so we see, first of all, Henry Adams took his flight from the dragon persecution in Devonshire, England, with eight sons. Well, there's seven sons and a daughter. It's nowhere near Devonshire, and scholars have not found a dragon persecution of any kind, although it sounds interesting. Um, I would like to. Um, so the first thing I had to do was unpack the family's memory of its own religious history, right? The kind of stories that families tell themselves about what happened and where they're from. John Adams had a very particular reason for putting this in. He wanted to etch in stone for the world to see all the virtues that might make you a good Adams and a good American. And I think that's a very striking comment um, on what he imagined his Puritan ancestor to be. Now, he was wrong about where Henry was from. His son, John Quincy, had a different idea, and the two presidents, second and sixth, father and son, disagreed on their family history to a great degree. But I can tell you a little something about Henry Adams. Now, in relationship to the quarter of a million manuscript pages that I had to describe and dig into the Adams family's travels, I didn't have much for Henry. I had maybe a pew deed, I had maybe his signature on a will, and that's really all I had. But it gave me some clue to the world I needed to build of his experience in England. And after 10 years, I can tell you of research, um, I agree with kind of three basic things that John Adams and John Quincy also knew about him, which is Henry Adams, um, who was forever in flight in family memory, brewed good beer, read widely, and married well. Okay, so these three things matter. Let me tell you why. So he brewed good beer because he was a maltster in England. He knew to supply for the town ale feasts. He made enough money that he could um, decide which preachers would be paid to preach at the local church. He was able to, and I know this from his will, he was able to read widely. He had what he called a core collection of old books that he willed to his sons and daughter, which I find really interesting, right? Um, and then finally, I can tell you he married well. He marries the granddaughter of a bishop, and in doing so, he picks up all of their glebe or church lands, which means he has a massive brewing business, he has a clientele, he's able to afford a library. So things seem like they're going fairly well um, for our Puritan ancestors here, Henry and Edith Adams. And they're in this small town of Barton, St. David. This is the church they would have prayed out. It's a place where the Protestant Reformation took root pretty easily. Um, and things were going well until about the 1630s. And then a man named Archbishop William Laud takes control of the Church of England and starts to change the practices in a way that Henry and others don't feel comfortable with. So here are some of the things that Laud does. He schedules interrogatories where you basically surveil your neighbors. Are they going to church? Are they stopping for prayers? What exactly are they doing? Does a woman like Edith know to put a veil on her head every time she comes back to the church from childbirth? 
things like this. Um, he's also really interested in centering power in the bishops and taking it away from the laity. That means heavy fines, possibly have your lands taken away if you disagree with Laud. So all of a sudden these things are changing, right? That, that library of books that Henry has, Laud's men can come anytime and rifle through it, and if they decide they don't like what he's reading, he's fined. Um, so that changes. He may have money, but he no longer is in charge of picking the preacher they hear. That's been centered back into the bishop's power. So the religious ecosystem in England begins to change. And here, when I was thinking about Henry and Edith, and I had this kind of scarcity of manuscript material, and I was really thinking about how to build their world, I encountered a question that I think really every historian who works on Puritans ran into, which is, you know, how Puritan was he, right? And was he interested in coming to the United States, what becomes the United States, for profit or for religious liberty? So we think with Henry it's kind of a mix of both. Um, we see here the planner's plea, um, a widely circulated pamphlet that certainly Henry and Edith would have been aware of that is written by a man named John White who never leaves England but who funds plenty of people who do in the Great Migration. Um, and so the Adamses, fueled by hearing these emigration sermons, um, start to think about leaving England because the English church feels increasingly corrupt and abusive and corrosive. They had one other big idea to guide them. This is an important idea because this idea of providentialism is going to guide our Adams family from the Puritans all the way to the Civil War. The idea of providentialism is that there is an omniscient being, right? that speaks through historical events, directly intervenes in human lives to fulfill a predestined plan. And so what Henry and Edith would have heard, they would have heard that it is God's will that you leave an abusive church and you come into a newer, freer version in the American colonies. And so they emigrate here in the 1630s. Um, and I just want to say briefly, when I was researching household gods, I did my very best to walk through the same religious worlds that the Adamses did whenever I could, to try and experience the church they went to or the psalm they heard. And so this took me kind of all over the place. Um, it took me to England and to Paris and to London and Washington, D.C., and of course here to Quincy. And of course the sharpest contrast, I thought, was this one between the Old World and New World. So see that Barton St. David church that they'd be used to, those high, narrow, Gothic arches. And then here's what they'd have instead here in Quincy, right, in the 1630s at what becomes the United First Parish Church. That original English church, they would have heard bells peal out to go to Mass on the high holy days, right? But it would be a very different kind of situation here in Quincy. You would have a con what becomes a Congregationalist meeting house. It's kind of like a narrow, unheated schoolroom. Um, and that meeting house doubled for the community as everything else. It was also where you voted. It was where town meetings were held. It was where surgeries were. And the thing that's quite striking about it is that you would have heard a very different call to worship. You would have had kind of a solo drummer in the town square or red flags fluttering. So almost overnight, their religious experience changed from England to America, um, which I think is quite striking to see. Now here we're back a little bit further along in our journey to President John Adams and First Lady Abigail Adams. And they have, again, committed to this idea of providentialism, but we're carrying it a generation forward. So let's think about it in an 18th century sense. So for John Adams, his sense of providence is close and powerful and political. He is incredibly shrewd at harvesting providentialist rhetoric when it comes time to rouse support for the um, American Revolution. He's very good at taking the memory, the very hazy memory, of Henry Adams and his fellow Puritans and pointing to them in his 1765 dissertation on the canon and feudal law and saying, look, we knew how to do this once. We knew how to recognize abusive power and overturn it 
in favor of liberty. So he's very adroit at using providentialist language of saying that definitely God is on our side um, during the American revolutionary cause. Now, Abigail's version of providence, it's a little different. Abigail grows up in Weymouth, about a town over from John, and she, her experience, her first kind of religious education is very much shaped by her biography, okay? So she's the middle daughter of a prominent country pastor. Um, and her father, again, has a fantastically well-stocked library that Abigail indulges in when farming tasks allow. One thing I love about Abigail is she is a providentialist through and through, but when it comes to her reading material and it comes to religion, this is something every Adams will do for the next 200 years. She loves to read radicals. She reads dissenters. She reads inventors and innovators when it comes to religion and spirituality. And I think that's really interesting because to become a revolutionary, you've got to read some. And Abigail certainly spends a lot of time in her father's library. While she's there, she also hones a sense of providence that's just a little different than her husband John's. Her providence is more focused on the finer brushstrokes of the arts. So she's more willing to see and hear providence. Maybe in the 1780s, she goes to um, Mass at Notre Dame with Thomas Jefferson, which can you imagine taking Thomas Jefferson to Mass? Um, and <laughs> Abigail is, is struck by the beauty of the architecture. She's very confused, however, about some of the propriety of practice there. Why would you whisper your sins through a little grate in order to receive absolution, she wonders. Why do people clatter in at midday just shuffling onto the altar? She's a little confused about that, but this Weymouth country pastor's daughter also has some kinder words for old world practice that we see in her letters home. She goes to hear um, the Messiah song, Handel's Messiah at Westminster Abbey. And when the Alleluia chorus rolls out, she's beside herself. She says, I was one continued shudder from the beginning to the end. She can't believe how majestic and interesting it is. So her sense of providence is a little bit more focused on the aesthetics. Um, but she, like John, is very certain that providence is on their side during the Revolutionary War. So here's a letter that John writes, and he's at the Continental Congress. She's home. Um, she's dealing with life in a city that's besieged by the British and smallpox with four small children um, and not regular correspondence, right, from her husband. And he sends this letter, and I read this letter. Certainly there is a providence. We must depend upon providence or we fail. Such confidence, I thought, <laughs> when I read this. What did Abigail think? And the truth is, her letter coming not much later, um, detailing the losses at the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, which are personal and grievous, they include the family physician, Dr. Warren, um, she is just as locked in to this idea that he is, that providence will guide them through, that there is a way out or a way through with providence's help. Um, it's a letter that perhaps you know for its opening lines, the decisive day is come, my bursting heart must find vent at my pen. Um, but in fact, I'm always struck by her recognition that using providentialist language to lace through really the hardest parts of her report helps them both cope. Um, you know, she says, Charlestown is laid in ashes, God is a refuge for us. This idea of providence as a refuge, providence as really something that John and Abigail have a direct dial to is something that we're gonna see again and again with the Adamses. Um, now, at the end of his life, John Adams, at the suggestion of his friend, again, Thomas Jefferson, um, came up with his own religious motto. And for John Adams, I can say honestly, it was pretty short and snappy, um, much like him, I guess, in some ways. And his, his motto was, be just and good. Very clear, very concise. Abigail Adams, in her final days, was very happy to keep searching. Here's a woman who is very interested in nursing piety more than parsing doctrine. I do not profess to be a theologian. I never would puzzle my head with their disputes. This last bit, what can we reason but from what we know? 
Well, to me, that really helps to understand Enlightenment Christianity, right? The idea of how science and faith can work together in a practical way. And I think she's, she's really forward thinking um, in her comments here. I did wonder, and if you've um, ever kind of read over family letters, you'll understand this too. I always wonder, since you're kind of eavesdropping on a historical conversation, what the person thought who got this letter, right? So I always kind of like flip to see like, but what did Louisa think? Um, And Louisa Catherine Johnson Adams had a very different religious upbringing. Um, Certainly, she wasn't Abigail. So I'm going to introduce you to Louisa first because I feel like that dashing diplomat on the left, John Quincy Adams, may be already familiar to you. Um, So Louisa Catherine um, grew up in Tower Hamlets, just in the shadow of the Tower of London. Um, Her mother was English, her father was a Maryland merchant, um, and they lived a pretty comfortable, I'd say, upper middle class life. They prayed at a church from time to time called All Hallows Barking, which you can still go and visit. It's the oldest church in London and sits right there in the shadow of the tower. Um, Her parents were kind of nominally Anglican, but they didn't attend mass regularly. Um, And in fact, during the American Revolution, the family was forced to flee briefly to Nantes, where little Louisa was introduced to the mysteries of Catholic devotion, which was a first for her. And in her own words, she said, she saw an image of the tortured Jesus and she fell to the floor, um, just horrified at the thought of mixing with heretics. Um, So this was her first kind of encounter with a very different religion. Um, She acclimated. She acclimated so much that when she came back to London um, to their Unitarian meeting house and school, she did not immediately take to Protestant practice again. Um, She was invited to prayers, and she fell immediately on the floor in a dead faint. And this won her a two-month reprieve from school. So... Louisa had her two months off, she went back, she fainted again, but after that, she was sent back to school permanently. Um, So we have kind of an interesting moment here with young Louisa, and it's going to be something we see recur again and again, which is Louisa's struggle, like so many Americans, for religious toleration. Now you have to remember Louisa Catherine, look at those dates, 1775 to 1852, that spans quite a wealth of time. What's going on in American religion in that time? Well, there's just a dizzying proliferation, right, of new religious ideas, different kinds of denominations, different practices, growth of American churches, development of spiritual music and the arts. And so she's kind of absorbing all of this change as it happens. So her life is an interesting one in a religious sense, and we can get on to that, I think, a little bit more, um, perhaps, in the questions. But I want to direct your attention to John Quincy Adams, um, our sixth president, um, and someone who left us these incredible diaries, um, just 51 volumes worth of his life, um, and was a great religious explorer, someone who in his diary often recorded his reinventions of the Psalms, the different forms of religion that he encountered in St. Petersburg, Sweden, Paris, The Hague, Washington, D.C., and Quincy. So he was often considered the most well-traveled man of his age. I think that if you had a couple of hours for another Maparium experience, John Quincy would be a wonderful person to track across the globe. Um, You can, I should say, read those diaries online at the Massachusetts Historical Society. His handwriting, isn't it great? Um, We welcome transcribers, so please let us know if you're interested. Um, In his diary, as I said, he recorded plenty of his religious experiences. He also recorded religious struggle. So here we see one of his diary entries when he's a fairly elderly man. He's preparing to argue for the liberation of the Mendy captives in the Amistad case, which may be familiar um, to many of you. And he is not quite sure how he's going to go about it, but he knows that his conscience presses me on. And this is just one of my my absolute favorite diary entries. Someone who realizes no one else will undertake it, no one but a spirit unconquerable by man, woman, or friend can undertake it. So here we see that link 
um, between the older Adamses who think providence intervenes in events, right, and guides them to do things, and John Quincy's generation who clearly recognize um, that slavery is, as they call it, the national sin um, that must be rectified. Here we are at our Adamses again. Here we are with our Victorian Adamses. Isn't this, isn't this quite a picture? Um, so this is Charles Francis Adams and his wife, Abigail Brooks Adams. Yes, he marries an Abigail. Um, Charles Francis is John Quincy's son. Um, and this picture is actually taken by their daughter-in-law, Clover. Um, so kind of an interesting commentary there on how she's chosen to frame the photograph. They're sitting on the front porch um, of uh, Peacefield in Quincy. Um, now, as you heard me say a little bit in the Mapparium, Charles Francis was quite a religious explorer. He liked to go on what he called religious journeyings away from his home church in Quincy. And like a lot of Adamses, he did a lot of reading, he heard a lot of gossip about other religions, and then he went to find out for himself exactly what they were all about. So he went to Catholic Canada, where he marveled at this beautiful architecture, and he was curious to know if some of the more salacious tidbits he'd heard about Catholic comments there by Maria Monk's memoir and others were in fact true. He was somewhat disappointed that they were not. Um, so here we have kind of an interesting moment in American religious history where our Boston Protestant population is going forth and thinking about um, the Catholic identity and how it will translate um, in their own city. He also went out west to Nauvoo um, with his cousin, Josiah Quincy, in the spring of 1844, just a month before this man, Joseph Smith, um, would be killed and met Smith. He did not put much emphasis on Smith's intellect, but he was fascinated by Smith's ability to harness sacred and secular power on the ground in Nauvoo. And he thought, aha, this is what Western religion looks like. And so we have another frontier opening in the Adamses' mind. The Adamses, Charles Francis and Abigail Brooks, continued on um, to Queen Victoria's London. Charles was serving as the US minister um, to Great Britain, and there they again sampled old world culture, a little bit different than the way their grandparents, right, John and Abigail had. In this sense, Charles Francis was really into the architecture. He was fascinated by a church's bones more than anything else, and less interested in whatever the priest had to say, and perhaps just a little bit more he was interested in how people conveyed those aesthetics in their worship. He said early on in his life, theology is not religion. And this turned out to be something I found again and again with the Adamses. They thought about religion as a part of culture. They were not interested in doctrine. They were very interested in how people connected to spirituality. And in London, he did his darndest um, with his young son, Henry, um, serving as his secretary to note down every Christopher Wren church that he could find and to write these really beautiful, evocative descriptions of what they looked like. He thought maybe American churches were too dark um, and not illuminated enough um, with the piety of their participants. Um, I tried to find some of these churches. I found a bunch, but many of them were lost in the blitz. And so sometimes I only have Charles's memory of them, which is kind of an interesting way to um, tie in his legacy, I think. And then finally, Charles Francis, um, for all that he was a Sunday school teacher and a literary editor and an Adams who did great diplomatic duty across the globe, um, he was always very hurt by the fact that he couldn't instill that good old-fashioned sense of American Unitarianism in his children. He noticed almost right away that one of his daughters could really only nail three commandments out of ten um, that they didn't like doing the little extra Sunday Bible verse singing on Sundays. Um, and that they just had kind of a general apathy to religion. And so this helps us think about those later Victorians moving into our final um, batch of Adamses here. And this, this total neglect of religious services, more than any other political defeat or diplomatic dilemma that he struggled with, this is what gutted him to the core. The idea that he hadn't transmitted some sense of American Christianity to his children. Um, and those children, of course, included Henry Adams, he of the education, 
um, and a series of novels as well. His wife, of course, was Clover, or Marion Hooper Adams, more properly, a gifted photographer who committed suicide um, in 1884, excuse me, 1885. Um, and Henry and Clover give us an interesting window into American religion as the centuries changed hands. So Henry has every single gift that an Adams can have. He has a Harvard education. He's the guardian of the family papers at one point. He has an incredible grand tour. He has managed to serve as his father's diplomatic secretary and as an anonymous correspondent for the Times, all by the time he's about 30. And then he goes to teach history at Harvard and completely reinvent the curriculum there as a medievalist. Um, so Henry, incredibly gifted, an arch a really arch and somewhat acid-tongued critic of American culture, no more so than after his wife's death. Um, and he skewers a great deal of ideas about American religion and science, particularly I found in his novels, Esther and Democracy. But Henry travels after his wife's death, um, and he kind of picks up the camera when she puts down her life. Um, and he has these incredible photograph albums that we're privileged to have that chart his travels all over Egypt, Japan, South America, Western America, you name it, Henry went there. He kind of went on a nonstop tour for the rest of his life. And he becomes someone who, while he is increasingly agnostic and dismissive of religion as something that is really something only useful for a historian to understand from time to time, like a hollowed out artifact. At the same time that his faith is being shed, he increasingly becomes a collector of all things touched by faith. So he collects religious art. He centers his curriculum at Harvard on medieval feminine divinity. He goes to places like Japan, and in Japan he spends about a quarter of a million dollars. That's like a Henry shopping day on religious art and artifacts. And he gives us these incredibly intimate portraits, right, of people of faith, at faith, by someone with no faith, which is a fascinating way to kind of think about Henry. Um, Henry's brother Brooks, a noted economist, I would say a noted economic analyst in his own right, um, kind of dives into both the Puritan legacy that he's been dealt, not so successfully, and he also takes up the same religious exploration that his brother does. Um, here he's shown at his rest home, his kind of refuge. His providence, as it turns out, is in Mumbai. Um, this is Brooks with his wife, Daisy, where they explore Hinduism, just as his brother Henry is exploring Buddhism. So a really interesting turn toward non-Western spirituality among our late Victorian Adamses. Um, and Brooks is, of course, extremely critical. As I said, he's one of our cosmopolitan Christians who comes back and has plenty of ideas about both the priesthood and how Protestants should perhaps reform their ways if they're going to carry this religion um, across the threshold of the American century. He's also super interested in Catholicism. He spends a lot of time going on retreats in the kind of neighborhoods of New England, and he often writes to say that he wishes he could leap the chasm um, from Protestantism to Catholicism. So just finally, so we can open up our conversation, um, I thought you might like to see the actual household gods of the household gods title, right? So I had this story, and I never really knew what to call this book until I walked up to this fireplace in Quincy. So this is the Stone Library, which is John Quincy Adams Library. It's a stone building that's just off of the Adams National Historical Park main building. And it's kind of the treasure trove where the family papers were kept before they came home to the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, and I saw these, these household gods here. And so these are a set of six bronze busts that John Quincy Adams picks up um, he's just about to leave Napoleon's Paris, and he kind of dashes in, picks them up. They're all different Greco-Roman orders, ones who recur through many Adams family letters. 
um, because this is a family that, again, has one eye on Massachusetts and one eye on the road. And so in the family, these household gods, as they're often called by the family, um, travel back and forth from Quincy to the White House and around. And it's very much a callback to their own classically infused principles, right? The idea that just like Virgil's Aeneas, they can pick something up in the middle of the night and take it with them to plant a whole new republic. And I thought, well, what kind of faith do you pick up and take if you're constantly on the road? And that's kind of what got me started on household gods, traveling alongside them, seeing the gods that they met. Thank you. Well, I probably, I mean, it's considered to be bad form to ask this kind of question but, um, about families, but do you have a favorite? Ooh, John, well, <laughs> Abigail. Yeah, okay. It's got to be Abigail. John would say Abigail. <laughs> okay, um, why is that? Why is she your favorite? You know, Abigail Adams stepped into a role that was undefined and unpaid and she had to do it right after Martha Washington. So I think I have incredible respect for her as a mother, wife, sister, political agent, and first lady. Um, I think she's the most complex for us to index. I mean, give a very documentary editor type question answer here. Um, because Abigail Adams, it's very easy with the men to say, public life, personal life. This is a public letter, this is a personal letter. With Abigail, we have such a rich infusion of both. And what I thought about a lot was how to bring her religious biography into what we know already. Um, and when I, I found out that, you know, she's off to mass with Thomas Jefferson, someone who very much treats her like an intellectual equal, I just couldn't stop reading. I think some of her letters to her sisters have the richest commentary on spirituality from early American women. So which of the Adamses is most relevant to us today? Who speaks to us today? Isn't Henry weird and interesting? Um, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think Henry is fascinating because here's someone who very much makes his scholarly career about being a secular academic, openly so, but is fascinated by different frontiers of spirituality. The fact that he is also the person who experiments with a wholly new medium, photography, mm. and thinks about how it can be used to frame faith, I just find that fascinating. I always think whenever, and maybe this is why I love Abigail so much, so thinking about worship and aesthetics and how those two can combine for a really fruitful spiritual experience, I think it's got to be, it's got to be Henry. I think he's, he really thinks it, and his ideas about medieval female divinity are still so interesting and so fully formed. Um, with Henry, I think, he was the hardest for me to write about, mm -hmm. so I hope you all read him, <laughs> and I hope you all write more about him, um, because he is an incredibly difficult intellectual to pin down on the page. His voice is so strong and so powerful, um, and his ideas are so big and often presented so glibly that you really have to work hard to understand him. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sense of the fact that he had this pervasive interest in things religious and spiritual, but claimed to be a person without faith. Um, well, it's interesting, right? So Henry thinks that he's very much his own unique being, and to a degree he is, but he is also mirroring a greater trend in American society at the time, right? So there's a sense that there's a hollowing out of piety in a lot of American Christian churches after the Civil War. There's a fearing of general apathy. The Civil War has you know, really sundered this idea of providentialism into, because no god backed north or south and no god would have allowed this to happen. Um, so there's very much a, a feeling of groping for explanation 
um, that Henry mirrors. I think he's more lost and dazed and confused than he wants to admit. Mm. Um, and I think that explains some of the choices he makes. I'm also not wholly convinced that he gave it up altogether. Um, I think that's something that perhaps with Henry, you have a bit of posturing on the page often, and I think that may have been the case. Certainly, he respected other people's religions, and he was interested in them. Mm. Well, I've read Mont Saint-Michel and mm -hmm. Chartres, um, so, and I didn't know he was uh, an atheist or an agnostic when I read the book. And had I been asked afterwards, um, I would not have imagined him to be an agnostic, an atheist, because he writes so fervently and so admiringly about the presence of, sort of female divinity um, in that book. So it's, it's curious to me that he could have that sensitivity, be so moved by what he's experiencing in those two cathedrals um, and those two locations, um, and at the same time sort of distance himself. I thought it. that was really fascinating. Just as I used Clover's photography to understand her, I used Henry's fiction to understand him and his idea of how women communicated about and in religious life. And I thought that was, that was something that I tried to do differently. Henry's education is a must read, I will say. Uh, I don't know if it's still being assigned, but it should be. It should be read with the caveat that it's perhaps the greatest con in American history writing. <laughs> it's Henry on kind of a literary gambit to see how far he can play with a theory. If you really want to understand Henry Adams, read Mont Saint Michel. Start with a killer opening line, the archangel loved heights, and just go from there. Mm. Uh, because what you see in Mont Saint-Michel and you see in his fiction is perhaps where he's most honest, just as you see most of Clover, not in her letters, but in her photographs. And that was really one of the wonderful things about doing a family history is using these different kind of media, just as they were learning about them too. So you, you, you talk about providentialism in the history of the United States, and I was not really sort of fully conscious of that concept, um, but it made me want to go to Mary Baker Eddy's writings to see what she's saying about this. And um, it's interesting to me, and I'd love your, your response to this. Um, this is from an address she gives um, to the National Convention of Christian Scientists in Chicago, Illinois, and it's uh, dated June 13th. 1888, um, and she sort of summarizes it um, under the title Science and the Senses, and she writes, quote, Christian science and the senses are at war. It is a revolutionary struggle. We have already had to in this nation, and they began and ended in a contest for the true idea, for human liberty and rights. Now cometh a third struggle for the freedom of health, holiness, and the attainment of heaven. And I'll just companion that with another one that specifically is about the, um, the Civil War. And she, she writes, um, quote, the history of our country, like all history, illustrates the might of mind and shows human power to be proportionate to its embodiment of right thinking. A few immortal sentences, breathing the omnipotence of divine justice, have been potent to break despotic fetters and abolish the whipping post and slave market. But oppression neither went down in blood nor did the breath of freedom come from the cannon's mouth. Love is the liberator. So how, how do you see her understanding of providentialism um, within that larger scope that the, the Adamses or just more generally people understood? That's really fascinating to hear because thinking about her eloquence in framing history as it unfolds and yet also doing it with such purposeful optimism, hats off to Mrs. Eddy on that because Brooks and Henry could not muster that level of eloquence right. during the war. Um, I think that there's a moment certainly after the Civil War where there's a turn to metaphysics, sure, and spirituality. Um, the Adamses really look for providence anywhere but in America. The idea to them comes home on the road that 
really for Henry and Brooks, non-Western spirituality is the place to go, that there are other providences that might be worth looking for. Um, so I think the idea of a homegrown and home-raised religion is something they fully turn their backs on and that idea of providentialism with it. Um, there's an idea that there is no more a predestined plan, that the Civil War has ruptured that idea wholly in the American mind. And clearly it hasn't completely. But for Henry and Brooks, you know, their task is less to build a community of faith it's more to detect patterns in history so they can do the one thing that historians really shouldn't predict. Mm -hmm. And this is something that they really seize on. I think maybe what I'm coming to in thinking through this out loud is that they start to think you're your own providence. You are fulfilling, you're making your own plan and you will unfold along with it. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting, thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, I, um... I think the, the Civil War was profoundly felt mm. by, by Mary Baker Eddy, but she did, um, she did not shy away from the difficulty of, mm. of these kinds of struggles, mm -hmm. and I think probably felt that, um, that the attainment of liberty, and for her, um, and she goes on in this passage that I just read from, you know, this ultimate attainment of liberty was going to be quite a mighty struggle. Um, mm -hmm. and she writes, quote, legally to abolish unpaid servitude in the United States was hard, but the uh, abolition of mental slavery is a more difficult mm -hmm. task. The despotic tendencies inherent in mortal mind and always germinating in new forms of tyranny must be rooted out through the action of divine mind. So I think she saw the providentialist project in, in really very large and profound uh, I think terms. it's also just an extremely agile construction of liberty and the language of liberty, which is maybe not something that your late Victorian Adamses would be conditioned to hearing anymore. So I, I think that's an incredibly nimble and astute way of drawing people in um, by explaining faith as a form of liberty. That's certainly not how they saw it, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because their experiences were colored a great deal by the history they were trying to write. I'm also curious in terms of the uh, experience of, of family, and, and we'll go to your questions right after this, but um, it seems like the, um, the experience of family for uh, the Adamses happens within a fairly tight-knit social world. Is that, is that right? They, um, they don't sort of, uh, they're not hybrids. They're not cross-pollinating um, with, with spheres of society that sort of are outside of their, their background. Is, would that be a, a correct I think that's true. Yeah, I mean, they certainly give us a study in class for the long 19th century. I mean, you do have one Adams man after another has a pretty standard template of certain kind of religious education, same church membership, goes to Harvard, goes on grand tour, settles into kind of Washington DC diplomatic duty or political life and then summers in Quincy. But their network, which we see in their correspondence, is incredibly diverse um, when it comes to friends and social contacts and colleagues and what they read and you know, where they go when they're in different countries. So I think they do diversify to that extent. They don't just stay in their own little kind of world. The Adamses have this phenomenal ability, kind of like Forrest Gump, to just show up at these great moments in American <laughs> history. Yeah. Um, and you think like, oh, you are also there. Um, when I got to Brooks Adams, I had this situation where he showed up to the opening of King Tut's tomb. And I thought, you also got to do that. Like, so yeah. it's, they kind of show up in these unexpected places, even though they do have a very standard social world that they are reared in and that they are respectful of. Mm. Um, there's been a book that's recently been published and it's about Mary Baker Eddy's final home, which was in Brookline, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and the title of the book is um, 400 Beacon Street, um, Life at 400 Beacon Street, Working in Mary Baker Eddy's Household. So in thinking about this whole idea of, of family, it's really interesting um, in comparison to the Adams to see uh, from this author's standpoint um, what Mary Baker Eddy's sort of ultimate experience of family was. Um, 
and, and I'll just quote from this book quickly, um, quote, uh, Mary Baker Eddy's household reflected the changing landscape of a still young America. Um, and so these people that came to be in her house, uh, some were U.S. citizens, but others were first and second generation immigrants whose roots stretched to Canada, Scotland, England, Ireland, Germany, Norway, and Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic. Um, these latter were pilgrims of a different sort, whose initial paths may have echoed the typical American immigrant experience, but who had also sought and found a higher sense of freedom, that of liberation from sickness, sorrow, and other limitations. In the end, these strangers who came together under Mrs. Eddy's roof were held together by a common goal, the desire to support and care for their leader. And she, in turn, supported and cared for them. She considered them family, and they lived as a family. As with all families, particularly large ones, the 400 Beacon Street staff numbered from 17 to 25 at various times, there was inevitably some chafing. Despite occasional conflict and tensions, by and large, the arrangement worked. Um, so I'd just be curious in your thoughts about you know, how that description of what family ultimately came to mean mm -hmm. for Mary Baker Eddy, how to look at that um, from the standpoint of family history as a way of understanding religious mm -hmm. history. Yeah, I think it's so interesting to consider family history as a lens, right, for us to understand how religion has changed in America, because from the period really that we've just covered, we've galloped through in the last hour, the colonial period to kind of the beginning of the 20th century, the cultivation, the education, the idea of devotion, um, those three ideas are nurtured in the home, really. It's mm -hmm. the idea that the Adamses hold to for most of that long 19th century that we swept through is that a family may go different places, right? There may be arguments, there may be different kinds of challenges they face personally or professionally, but the idea that the Adamses and most Americans had is that the family will always reunite in heaven. And so this is something that um, really translates between the generations really well for a good long time. Um, I was very struck by thinking about the home rather than the church as a place where the Adams children first received reli religious instruction um, as a place where it um, kind of became a springboard for them to go explore different religious worlds. So the family was, for the Adamses, yes, a political brand. They were incredibly astute at how to manage it, too. But part of that brand was to be Protestant, to be prudent, or what they became, Christian, cosmopolitan, and curious about other faiths. Well, um, love to hear from, from all, all of you, or any of you, if you have any thoughts or, or questions. Um, any generation. Any generation. 300 years. <laughs> Well, we'll just, we'll get you amplification. A quick, hello, there we go. Yes. About the busts. Yes. On the mantle. I imagine that they were selected carefully, and I would love to know who's there, <laughs> and anything that you might know about why some of them were chosen. Here's the thing, they came as a set. You did not get to pick them out. <laughs> um, so they're by um, a man who was formerly a bronze maker to Napoleon um, and who had recently died um, and was a, a great kind of master artisan. And I often think that John Quincy Adams, or as I often call him, JQA, I just slip into Adams papers <laughs> lingo, um, picked them up because he knew the backstory of this artist, because the Adamses were incredibly involved um, with plenty of artists in the course of their political careers. And I would imagine he knew this too. So the master artisan 
Antoine Rabrio, who just died, had left this incredible will that funded the care of um, other iron and bronze workers who had fallen ill due to long exposure to fumes. So he's a very like philanthropically minded artist. And I often like to think that JQA knew this. Um, but when he dashed in to pick up that set, which is fully iterated in my illustration caption. I'm forgetting everyone but Cicero for the moment because Cicero is always the Adams' favorite. Um, it came as a set and these were the people, Cicero, Demosthenes, Virgil, these were the people that should show up on your mantle and whose principles you should know to scoop up and take with you in the middle of the night. And the Adamses were often leaving somewhere in the middle of the night so it seemed kind of on brand for them to grab them. Um, but if I had to pick just one, Cicero, that's the one that every Adams is told to read. Um, and in fact, John Adams is such a um, fan of his that he writes a very long letter to his son, John Quincy. When John Quincy loses his first case, he says, Cicero did too, you'll be <laughs> fine. Um, so they had, a, they had a, quite a connection to them. I was just wondering, did the 19th century Adamses uh, consider themselves Unitarians? Yes, is the short answer. Um, but the longer answer is, it's really John Quincy Adams who formally invests in Unitarianism shortly after his father's death um, as that United First Parish Church is transitioning um, through the Unitarian controversy and moving through it. Um, but John Quincy Adams is also, for all that he's a Unitarian, he is an incredibly shrewd politician. And when he's in Washington, D.C., he buys a pew in several different denominations so he can show up there. Um, so sometimes he'll be at the Presbyterian Church visiting those constituents. Sometimes he'll be at the Catholic Church visiting those constituents. He really makes the rounds. In terms of his theology, probably closest to Unitarian. Um, but again, it's a family that's not wholly bound by, I am of this particular set of beliefs. They are more interested in being religious explorers. Um, but nominally, yes, I would say they dwell in a harbor of Unitarianism very happily for most of the long 19th century. So we have time for one more question. I think there was one here. This is really mundane, but I am curious. You mentioned Cicero, Demosthenes, and Virgil. Do you remember who the other three were? Off the top of my head, no. Okay. <laughs> okay no, I, I love classics, and I'm finding this fascinating. I'm going to research it myself. Ah, wonderful. Well, we could use more kind of forays into how Americans approach the classics in the antebellum period. So that's a great research topic, only because John Quincy operated in what we think of as the golden age of rhetoric, right? The rise of Lyceum movements in New England, of people really experimenting with writing capital R romantic poetry like he did. So how Americans use and abuse and reinterpret the classics in that period is a, a great topic to explore. Well, you can easily find your answer in, in this book. Um, and we can probably um, find it out right after um, we, we close our session with you. Um, there'll be time to informally talk for a little bit um, before we close the building. So thank you so much, thank Sarah. You. It's been wonderful to, to be with you.